Hi, welcome to the Tilder candidate meetup. This is for the city council from the, the city council position from the 45th district. And we have three of the four candidates running with us this evening. We're really delighted to have them with us. My name is Lulu Freistat. I live in Tilder. Uh, I live with my husband, Joseph, and um, we've owned a home here for seven years. It's a wonderful neighborhood. And we're really excited to find out what these candidates are going to do for our neighborhood, what their plans are, their dreams are, their visions to improve our community and make it a place where we can all grow and prosper. So um, we're gonna have a format where we have questions that we've prepared in advance and each candidate will have a certain amount of time to answer the questions. We'll let you know that time up front. And then Joseph is gonna be a timekeeper. He'll let you know when you have about 30 seconds left at that point, we'll ask you to please wrap up. And I think when you will give you a little time to introduce yourself at that point, it would be great if you would just say your website or where people can find out more information about you, because obviously in two hours, we can't cover every single topic under the sun. And I'm sure you have a lot more details that you want people to know about your policies. Um, so please do add your website. So we're gonna start in alphabetical order first. And the first thing that we're gonna ask is if you would please introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about your background, your relationship with the community and your top three priorities to get accomplished if you do get elected as the 45th district city council person. And we'll start with Anthony Beckford. You have three minutes, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lulu. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Tilly Block Association. Um, you know, definitely, you know, I like this, you know, honor to my fellow candidates as well too, and to the community in general in the 45th. My name is Anthony Beckford. I am running to become the 45th city council district, you know, um, next council member. In regards to, you know, a little bit about me, I am a United States Marine Corps veteran. I am a single father. I am the president and co-founder of Black Lives Matter Brooklyn. I am the president of the Brooklyn chapter of Cop Watch Patrol Unit. I'm a youth mentor. You know, um, a UFT, former UFT member, um, current freelancers union member, amongst many things, you know, brother, son, you know, fellow community member, dedicated advocate, you know, for our community. I've been advocating since the age of 12 years old. That's where my advocacy started in regards to education, you know, stop the, you know, what we consider to be racist rezoning of our school district or the school district 18 at the time. Uh, when I went to um, IS 232, which is Winter Junior High School. From there, as I got older, I've expanded with my advocacy as well too, you know, I um, went beyond education and included in housing, um, included um, many social justice issues like police accountability, um, you know, um, you know, everything that's going on with NYCHA, you know, healthcare, climate, you know, and, and many other many other issues that we face within the district because it is definitely a revolving door of issues, you know, and many times we have to be on many fronts to combat these issues. So um I feel that I'll be the you know best next council member for the district due to my years of service. You know, one as an elected um, Democratic County Committee member, um, not not with the Brooklyn um, Dems um, machine, but outside of that, you know. But then also in my long lasting service to the community, that even when I went to the Marine Corps and came back, I still continued with that service and have taken many youth underneath my wing to help, you know, guide them in what to do when it comes to service. You know, I've been combating against gun violence in our communities to provide, you know, services, resources, and even opportunities to the youth, you know, to get them away from gun and gang violence. You know, um, I've been very consistent in regards to it. I've been in the 20s, I've been in the 50s, and we know how hot those areas are and engage with the youth, you know, and they see we'll be able to be successful in many ceasefires and even get some of them out of the current gangs at the moment. You know, but um, yeah, you know, so basically that's that's a little bit about me and I uh, definitely look forward to the rest of this forum. And can you tell us what are your top three priorities? That was kind of a lot of information you threw oh, okay. <laughs> So if you are elected, what are the top three goals that you have for our community? Top three goals, the number one is definitely to bring about 100% affordable low to moderate income um, housing in the community, you know, truly affordable housing. And that's not just with tenants. That's also with homeowners. That's also with NYCHA residents as well too. Um, the next is education. We may be gaining a lot of funding, but we're not receiving the resources, services, and wraparound services that are needed as well in and outside of school. Um, and you see the, one of the incidents that just occurred down the block from me at PS361 that, proved, that has proven that. Um, and the next thing after that 
is to make sure that we have a good, adequate um, resource and, um, and, 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 and service hub for our youth and seniors. So one, to provide them with the access and services and resources that they need, but also to bridge that gap that has been created within our community amongst the seniors and, and the youth. You know, to show them that they can, you know, that they can work hand in hand and get rid of some of the stereotypes, you know, that each of them may think about each other out there. So that way we can become a community and not just think of ourselves as neighborhoods. Thank you so much. And where do people find out more information about you? Um, you can find more information about me on my website, anthonybeckford.com, on Twitter, vote the number four, Anthony Beckford, I mean, vote for Beckford, um, and on Facebook and Instagram, it's the same, Anthony Beckford, the number four, city council. Can you put those into the chat for us, please? Yes, we'll do. Okay, I appreciate that. Okay, next we're going to have Lou Cespedes. Lou, please introduce yourself and tell us your three top priorities and where we can find out more information about you. Thank you. Hi, Lulu, and thank you for Tilda for putting this to, uh, this forum together. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you again today. For those of you that know me, um, you know it's it's really a treat to be able to um, to uh, address you today. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Lou Cespedes. I am a father of a beautiful three-year-old. I am a homeowner in this community. I am an engineer by training. Uh, I am also a homeowner advocate. I am a Christian and I am a writer for the Caribbean Times where I write uh, about issues uh, confronting the 45th district and communities and com communities beyond. Um, my top three pri priorities are uh, very simple. I believe that uh, you know we start with the little things and if you are faithful in the little things, you can get to the big things. So something that's very important to this uh, this organization to Tilder are your flower beds. And I think that you guys work very hard on them. And so I wanna start with this simple analogy. You work so hard to make sure that your flower beds are beautiful, but every day you wake up to find them littered with garbage. And that is a perfect analogy for the type of leadership that we have in this community. It's not that there is not a will on behalf of community members. It is simply that your will is not reciprocated and honored by the leadership in this community. And so my top two, three priorities are one, to clean the garbage off our street and find a permanent solution for that problem. My second priority is to provide after school vocational training targeted to 12 to 18 year olds in public private partnerships. And my third priority is to stop the rezoning of our community. One of the things that you should know about me is that I am an engineer. I solve problems, that is what I love to do. And that is the only reason why I feel that I am the adequate person to lead the, the, the person with the adequate skill set to lead this community. Um, I am very happy uh, to be a mentor at a great organization called Children of Promise. I am a board member. Uh, I have been a mentor there for three years and we deal with all sorts of issues with, chi uh, with children uh, that are in homes of incarcerated parents. And I, bring to, and I plan to bring that model to our community, working in close collaboration with the clergy and with uh, our public schools. It is just uh, a shame that uh, Romeville Saint lost his life to bullying, steps away from Farrah Lewis's office after uh, the authorities knew that he was complaining about being bullied. Uh, we have uh, failure after failure in our community. And I am glad uh, today to have the opportunity to share my vision for the solutions that I bring to this community and I'm very happy not to be burdened with spending airtime, um, someone defending you know, their abject failure. Uh, I wanna give you uh, the assurance that everything you will hear from me today will be spot on about solutions and not about budgets and not about you know, funding. You will hear that from uh, my, fellow, uh, my fellow candidates, but you will not hear that from me. I will approach every problem the way I approach uh, the problems that I do at work, the way I've been trained. For every, every problem is a solution waiting to be found. I believe that. And that's the kind of skill and that's the kind of, of tenacity that I plan to bring to this district when I am elected your next council member. For those of you that want to see more information about me, you can please follow me on Twitter at Lufer Flatbush. You can also visit my website at luferflatbush.com. Uh, there you will find more information. If you have any specific questions about any issue, 
you can reach out to me via email at info at lufer45.com. Uh, and I am uh, looking forward to having a, uh, a very robust debate this evening with you. That's lovely. Thank you so much. And if you could put your, your information in the chat for your websites and your Twitter and things like that. Um, so next we'll have Cyril Joseph. And I'm going to unmute you. Uh, I had muted you just because it was a little bit loud there. Can you unmute yourself, Cyril? And I'll just say, I think we have a few more people who have joined us now. So we had invited the current council member, Farah Lewis, to join us here at the Tilder Block Association candidate meetup. Uh, we did schedule this specifically to try to work around her schedule. We scheduled it on a Sunday evening when she doesn't have city council meetings. Um, she did decline to participate. Uh, and we are going to be interviewing her separately on Tuesday. And we will put that interview up uh, on YouTube and hopefully on our Facebook page as well. And uh, Cyril Joseph is unmuted now. Cyril, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. And please, if you could briefly tell us a little bit about yourself, your three top priorities for our community and how we can find out more about you. Yes. My name is Cyril Joseph. I'm a community activist. I've been in the United States in the early 60s, excuse me, and I've been a community activist for over well over three decades. I'm a former member of community board four. I am a member of the uh, clergy council. I'm a community activist, I said, I am, I, am the, I am a past Democratic County Committee member, current state Democratic Committee member on the state level, and I'm a member of the DNC. I am running for office because I want to make a change within our district. And when I walk through the district and observe what's going on, I am seeing many places as closed, businesses closed, people are crying about the extra burden that they have facing housing, whether it's be renting or home ownership. I'm looking at the catch basins are overflowed. The streets are not properly illuminated. And the uh, parks need cleaning. We must, Can I be in the video? we must take this here, parks and recreation very, very, very seriously. We must take this thing very, 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 very seriously because parks and recreation is a place that's for people to enjoy the same as we see today. I mean, my part for the public, it must be kept clean, it must be tidy and everything. And my top priority, my three top priorities uh, housing. Anything dealing with housing, whether it's rent, home ownership or foreclosures. Any problems dealing with housing, that's my number one top priority. I will hire a, a housing czar who is going to address all the problems dealing with housing. Because my philosophy is you come in for a problem, is a pyramid, you come at the bottom of the pyramid with problem, and when you leave my office, you must leave at the top of the pyramid with all your problems solved and satisfied. My number two priority is economy development and small business, because both of them go together. We cannot say just economy development and not take on for small business. We must expand the access of small businesses to gain whatever funding that's there for them as we do in Chicago, Illinois, we could bring to New York City. Cut out the red tapes. There's too much red tape for a small business owner or a small business operator to get access for fund, to funding. My third priority is to create the vocational training center, which will produce high paying jobs for children because today, in today's world, everything is technology. And if we train our children in high tech, how to maneuver high tech jobs, 
we could get them proper jobs for the future. That's my three top priorities. Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for all of you. Those are really great suggestions. And I, it's really great to hear kind of the fullness of your ideas. Um, do you have a place where people can find out more about you, Cyril? Yes, as a matter of fact, you could find me at CyrilJoseph.com on Facebook, Twitter, and the Instagram. Okay. Or if you want to check me out, you can check me out at Cyril, CyrilFJoseph.com. It's and Cyril you could F. also Joseph. follow me on. Yes. Okay. Are you able to? I put CyrilJoseph.com in the chat, but maybe that's not correct. No, it's Cyril, Cyril F. Joseph. Oh, hi. Hi, Hello. can you put that in the chat? For us? Yeah, sure. Um, okay. I'll put the, the social media and the website stuff in the chat. That yeah, would be great. Okay, okay. Michael McKeeson. Excellent. Great to okay. have you here. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on. Yeah, my name is Amy. Thank you. Hi, thanks so much for being here. So the next question my is communication something. Director, so. <laughs> yeah, she's doing a great job. She's communicating really well. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, a lot of the questions that we have today are from conversations that I've had as I was going around the, the community and inviting people to the forum, I would ask them what is on their mind. And I have to say, one of the things I hear about the most is police accountability. People do not feel safe. We know this is a predominantly black district with many people of color. And I wanna know, are you following the dialogues of what is happening in other communities, how they're structuring programs to make their police more accountable? And what are your, ideas about how we're going to make our police more accountable. Uh, two minutes each, please, to answer this question. And this time, we'll start with Lou uh, Cespedes. Thank you. Sorry. Hi, Lulu. Thanks. Thank you for the question. Much has been said about police accountability uh, since the murder of George Floyd. Very little has been done. Uh, last summer, we saw our neighborhood uh, bedeviled by protests. Uh, those protests have largely uh, gone, uh, have, been, have been largely ineffective in bringing about reform. Um, there's a lot of conversation about defunding the police, which is a very unpopular idea in this community, uh, but one that you know, my fellow candidates, uh, you know, some of my fellow, fellow candidates have advocated and that the, uh, and that the council member has been uh, largely, a conversation that the council member has been largely absent from. She voted for the budget last year, uh, which was panned uh, and rejected by uh, many uh, on the left and on the right um, for a variety of reasons. Um, Governor Cuomo, although he's not that popular these days, last fall um, offered for communities to create their own plan uh, of action within their, uh, within their police precincts. And many of my contemporaries have either not developed the plan or not spoken about this issue at all. And so um, I think that to be an antagonist of the police uh, is not helpful and it is not putting you in a position of leverage to really have the kinds of conversations with leadership within our precincts that we need to have. So I would use the structures that uh, have been given to us. And my position is that we should Look at uh, we should look at uh, unfunding the police in one billion dollar increments over the next four years, three billion over four years. That's great. Thank you so much, Mr. Joseph. Yes, ma'am. As for police defunding, is that what you asked about? Defunding police. Well, really, it's your vision, right? This is a very complicated issue, and we need the police to keep us safe. But if the police are not making people safe, if the police are actually a danger to some communities, how are we going to? How are you going to approach that personally? What is your idea, and how are you going to work with the city council to make our community more safe in regard to the police? Okay, my vision for making the police and the community come, become better acquainted and working safer is community policing. Bring back community policing, period. And so can in you just my, tell us what that would, like what would be community policing? Right, tell us about right, that. Right, right, right. I will tell you because when I, I, I'm, a, I'm an ex-police officer. And during my days when I was policing, we used to know everyone on the street. We use three words, 
CPR, courtesy, professionalism, and respect. We treat everyone with courtesy. We respect them and we go in a professional way. Now, nowadays, the police only feel that because they're wearing the badge and the gun, they could use a gun right quick. But they do not know how to speak to people. We need to retrain them of the true meaning of CPR. And if they do not follow the procedure of CPR, then you terminate them, fire them, get rid of them. They are no good. I am not saying that all police are no good. There are many good policemen. But is two or three in a bar in the bunch, like you have two or three bad apples in a whole bushel of apples that corrupt the system. So we get rid of those bad ones and train people. And what are you going to do about the unions which protect the police and make it very hard to fire them? For the unions that make it so hard to fire them, we go and do legislation, craft legislation to stop that nonsense because these are pol these are human lives. These are human lives. We are there to protect human lives, and people are there to respect police officers. Because police officers do a very damn good job protecting us. Because I have done it for over fifteen years. And when I leave my house in the morning time, I'm not quite sure if I'm coming back in the night. When I come back in the night, I knock the window and say, thank you, Jesus, I'm here. And it's getting worse nowadays. So we got to craft legislation to stop all that nonsense. Okay, thank you so much. That's very helpful. Anthony, what are your ideas about this issue? Um, my, my ideas are very progressive and have been tested and proven. Um, over time, you know, one, like I said, again, as the president and co-founder of Black Lives Matter Brooklyn, but then also as the president of the Brooklyn chapter, Kyle Bob. We sorry, need- Can you say that more slowly as the president of what? Oh, oh the president, sorry, the president and co-founder of Black Lives Matter Brooklyn, and also as the president of the Brooklyn chapter of Cop Watch Patrol Unit, you know, we've seen the interactions. So that, that is basically our duty to record the interactions. You know, we always ask who polices the police? Um, us as a grassroots organization, you know, we basically go out there and re-record these incidences. We empower the community. We give the, you know, we do know your rights trainings to the um, community members. And then also we do engage with many officers who do want to see things change within their own breaches. You know, I even have an audio from an officer who literally said that he's more scared of officers in his precinct than he is of the gangs in the streets. You know, and this is from two years ago. You know, so one thing that we want to do is provide, you know, the police officers who do want to get rid of these bad apples a way to protect them, like whistleblower protection. As you've seen in, in the 40th district, we had Edwin Raymond there, who literally has been targeted by the police union, by fellow officers, and so forth, with minimal protections. You know, we can't have that, because that's how we actually hold them accountable. But in regards to accountability, our city council has failed to bring teeth to the enforcement of accountability. You have a CCRB that is basically appointed by the police commissioner, by the mayor, now the public advocate, you know, and so forth. But yet, how does that, how do we hold, how do we even know that they're holding them accountable if many of them are taking money from the PBA and so forth? So okay, we and need just to- sort of, just because a lot of acronyms in there, so people who may not be yeah. following you. Oh, the <laughs> the CCRB, the review board, right? That's yes, the Civilian Complaint Review Board. The PBA okay. is the uh, Police Benevolent Association. Um, I'm for an ECRB, which is an elected civilian review board, where they're actually elected from within our community to actually get provide the accountability that's needed. I'm for bringing the powers of firing officers away from the police commissioner to the council. I'm for actually holding the PBA president at Lynch and also the SBA president at Mullins accountable for every instance where they um, incite um, basically violence against the black and brown community. Um, I'm about making sure that we are very transparent on the spending of the of the NYPD being effective. Not only do they get a $6 billion budget from the city council, but they also receive over $11 billion more from corporations as well. You know, so we need to make sure that we start looking at that budget and reallocate those funds back to the community, you know, and make sure that we truly hold these officers accountable. Body cameras were not enough. You know, we need to make sure that we're not only giving them paid vacation days, that we're taking away paid, that we're taking away rent, and we're also taking away, you know, um, jobs as well too. Because as the Marine Corps veteran, if I committed any of these acts that they committed during wartime, 
trust and believe I'll be in the break. Thank you so much. I have so, a question. Yeah. Will there be an opportunity for rebuttals here? I mean, if somebody specifically calls you out, Lou, but I think okay. right now we're just, just moving forward. We have a lot of topics that we'd like to get to and we're actually a little bit behind. So I'm actually gonna kind of tighten up the uh, time for each topic. And that's why we have people, why we had you give them your website. And it's great that people can email you directly. You gave your email. So um, I think people can follow up if they have more questions. So we're gonna pivot to housing. It was something that many of you mentioned in your introductory remarks. How are you specifically going to help tenants and homeowners stay in their homes and improve their quality of life? It's something that we see over and over again in neighborhoods under development, people get forced out and they don't have the resources to stay. And even if they do stay, also our resources coming in to help them, like for example, I know nobody really ever talks about this, but there's problems with pests in New York City, with insects, with roaches, with bed bugs. What mm -hmm. type, I've never heard any of the city council members talk about giving homeowners or tenants help to address those type of issues. So specifically, how are you gonna help tenants and homeowners stay in their homes and improve their homes? And let's just do a minute and a half for this because we do have a lot to get to. And uh, I think it's uh, Cyril's turn to start. Yes. I'm glad I brought this question up on how to pet the pets, pets, pets in, the, in the housing. I think we had a conversation about this uh, basement apartments. My view on my philosophy when I become a city council member, the way I'm going to assist tenants in the housing process, stop them from eviction, pest control. I will craft and pass legislation that every house, whether it be Niger, private house, or public housing, as long as you have a tenant in your apartment, must be uh, Humigated by by pest control, and I'm not talking about just going and swearing. We don't have a pest in the house. Let no let no hold still. Let no one hold still. Let all them cracks filled up for rats and mice not to come in, because some landlords have houses and they will not even sleep one night in there because of the condition of the house. And so we're going to craft, we're going to have legislation that are going to protect tenants against all these injustices that's been given to them or hand down to them by the landlords. Okay, thank you so much. And then next up, it's Anthony. Yes, um, I'm glad you asked that, Lulu. Um, I have what is called a housing justice plan, which is one of the reasons why I've been endorsed by a majority of the housing um, um, act activists and advocate groups throughout New York City, you know, like NYCC and you know, Tennis Pack and many of them. In regards to housing, I wanna make sure that we provide um, afford true affordable, low to moderate income housing for our tenants to make sure we have implement rent rollbacks. Um, the Rent Guidelines Board has proven that they cannot be trusted with this matter. So we need to legislate this. New York City has not, I believe, has not had a um, rent rollback since 1971. Um, for the property owners, I do want to, for the small homeowners, I want to bring back uh, property tax rollbacks as well too. So that way they're no longer taking on the increase in taxes from the, you know, from the rent, um, tax abatements that these developers receive, you know, building up these towers within our community, space in many community members. In regards to that, the tax, the property tax rollback will be rolled back to your purchase value of your home, and this is coming from years of talking with other um, homeowners, well, talking with homeowners in regards to what their needs are in regards to that. Next thing is to make sure that we have fully funded um, NYCHA developments and make sure that we do, we do not continue with the privatization of NYCHA because it is not positive for the people in NYCHA at all. You know, next thing is to make sure that when we hire to maintain NYCHA, that we hire within NYCHA itself, which will then boost the economy as well too, but then also provide you know, people with the income to afford housing. 
you know, and we must make sure that when we're looking at developers, we're not looking at for-profit developers. We have to look at nonprofit developers. We have to turn shelters into permanent housing. We have to turn these um, hotels that many of our community members have been sent to because they're homeless. We have to turn those into permanent housing as well, too. They're paid out 35, uh, um, owners of these are paid out 3,500 a day. You know, that right there, you know, you could basically get numerous apartments for numerous people. We need to increase the FEPS vouchers you know, to make sure that we're actually providing, you know, vouchers that can actually pay for a down payment of an apartment, you know, and, and the first month's rent as well, instead of, you know, giving a, um, single mothers and single parents and families $750 to $1,200 when the rent is ever increasing. You know, we also need a 10-year rent freeze as well, too, you know, because we cannot continue saying that we need affordable housing, but yet we continue raising the rent and pushing our community members out in the streets. You know, homelessness has increased at a dramatic rate, you know, especially during COVID. You know, we've had a lot of illegal evictions. You know, right now there's a there's a moratorium on evictions, but in the moratorium, I feel it needs to be explained to homeowners who are also landlords, you know, that there is relief for them as well too. And we need to make sure that we provide even more relief, you know, for our homeowners. So that way they can, they can have relief, our tenants have relief, and we can keep the uh, um, integrity of our communities together instead of it turning into a little Manhattan. That's great. Thank you so much. And if you can, just try to stay within the time frame that I'm giving you. And Joseph will give you that um, little note. Hopefully, we just I want to make sure that we get to you know a number of topics. But that was very comprehensive. Appreciate that. My apologies and my apologies, Joseph. <laughs> no problem. Um, uh, Lou, you're up to bat. So I just want to you know uh, make sure that everyone understands and listens very carefully to the words and the quality of the answers that you're receiving. I am the only person here that knows how to procure affordable housing. I've been doing that professionally for the last 10 years. I already have a bill that was passed within the city council, uh, a project that I worked on called the Accessory Dwelling Unit. It's a pilot program in East New York. That program is now uh, being passed at the state level, and that will give homeowners the uh, clarity, the, the regulatory clarity to rent their basements and cellars, and that will be more income for homeowners. We need to provide more tax abatements to homeowners uh, that provide their basements and cellars as affordable housing. And that will be a lifeline to most, most homeowners to pay their taxes and to maintain their homes. One of the biggest things that we can do to make sure that we keep rents affordable is to stop the rezoning of our community. The 421A is an abatement that is funded by homeowners. And so every time you see a new uh, multifamily unit come online, you are paying for that. You are subsidizing as a homeowner, you are subsidizing that construction and you, they are not providing affordable housing. So um, I think that it's very odd that my colleagues, you would, would talk about, you know, providing affordable housing when actually they have no idea how that's even done. And so you want to rent rollback. We've had a moratorium for uh, well over a year now. Um, and there has been absolutely no relief for homeowners. So as a homeowner advocate, that is my plan. Address the homeowner and you will address the tenants and you will address the question of affordable housing because homeowners are the biggest providers of affordable housing in our community. That's great, thank you so much. And I think we saw a wide variety of solutions there. So I think that's great. Each of you had a different approach. I'm gonna um, pivot now to something that's connected to that. And that has to do with contributions. I did look up in each of your contributions that are listed with the New York City Campaign Finance Board, who's accepting contributions from real estate brokers and construction companies and sort of that um, segment of the, of the population. And I did find that Anthony, actually you were of this group in the lead in that in terms of contributions from real estate brokers. Uh, you had about a thousand dollars from your contributions from real estate brokers. Farrah was actually ahead of you with $2,100, but she raised a good deal more money. So your percentage actually of contributions from that um, from that group was was higher. Lou, it looked like you had raised about two hundred and ninety dollars from real estate brokers or um, people in that category. So I just I think I understand everybody's kind of scraping for money and you're all trying to just get your campaigns going. Um, but it's a question I think the community has a right to ask: Does accepting money from the real estate industry compromise you in regard to the issue of development, since it's such an important issue right now for our neighborhoods? Um, is that something that the community should be asking of each of the, of the candidates to not accept contributions from 
real estate developers and brokers, or I, I'd just like to give each of you a minute to talk about that. Um, Mr. Joseph, I think you're up to bat next. Okay, I am not, I am not going to tell any candidate whether they should or should not accept money from real estate brokers. The only thing I'm looking at is I, uh, I in particular, will not accept money from real estate brokers. But I do not want to be in the pockets to say, well, I gave you this and there's a thing coming up. I, I need you to help me. I am not going in there to do favors to no real estate broker or no big lobbyist. I don't want big lobbyist money. The question of if people should ask that, yes, they have a right to know. If you're going to accept money from these special interest groups and what are your commitments to these special interest groups when you become a city council member? Here. You're muted. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And Anthony, you're next. And I am going to go ahead and put into the chat the website, anybody in the community can do this research. It didn't take me long. You can go and you can look at contributions and see um, from every different category, uh, you know, who's donated to the candidate. So I encourage people to, to take a look at that information. Anthony, what are your thoughts about this? Yes, definitely. The community has a right to know where every single dollar and cent is, you know, coming from. So they also need to know who's beholden to who. You know, I've been a person that I've always, I made it clear, even on my contribution on um, website, that I will not take money from real estate developers, will not take money from, you know, from, um, you know, from special PACs and also from special interest groups. In regards to real estate brokers, I got to look at my thing to find out who exactly was with some of these real estate brokers. But one person I know that, that deals with real estate in the community has been a matriarch in the community and has actually been providing affordable housing to many in the community as well too. You know, so they are definitely different than developers because I've been battling developers for a long time now. You know, as you can see what developers have been doing to the integrity of our community, you know, so um, definitely they should ask that. Okay, and Lou, so you're saying that yes. yeah, they should ask that. Yes they, okay. yes. yes, they have a right to know. Yes, they have a right to ask. Uh, I work with developers uh, every day and so, it's surprising uh, that I have not received any money from developers. I don't believe in purity tests, but you should know that my campaign is largely uh, self-financed. I am a one-man team. And so I do most of uh, my campaign expenditures um, are things that I do on my own. And so, you know, I really have very little need for a, a, a large, a large uh, you know, funding source. But, you know, that being said, uh, I do believe it compromises yeah. you. Uh, just like any donation, just like any donation compromises you. So it's important for people that are worried about it to also donate to our campaigns. If they're worried about where our money's coming from, they should donate to our campaigns because otherwise, you know, in order to compete, we have to go and get money from people like real estate developers, you know, tech companies and things of that nature. So, you know, it's incumbent on you, the, the community member to donate. Thank you so much. Very clever way to <laughs> swing a pitch there. <laughs> Nicely done. And as long as we're on this topic, let's just spend one minute more uh, and we'll just stay with, Lou, with you, Lou. Uh, you did start to talk about the zoning and I just wanna make sure that we focus on it uh, at least exclusively for a minute. What exactly are the zoning issues that we need to face as a community and how can you help us make sure that we retain the personality and, and uh, historical nature of our neighborhood and that it doesn't turn into basically just a space that developers you know run wild with a, a space that's that, that our communities um, have a place for small business owners and the residences that have been here historically how can we do that and how will you specifically lead that so i mean the the simple answer is that zoning in our community is fine and it should not change uh you can only build a maximum of six stories in this community that is what uh, that is within the character of the community. Most of the housing and uh, and buildings that we have in our community are only two stories. And so it's only natural uh, that, you know, development will come. What I do not believe in is upzoning for downzoning because uh, homeowners uh, like you and I, 
uh, Lulu, have uh, two family homes and you have air on top of your house that is an inherent part of the value of your, of your home and your land. And when you down zone, you take away that wealth from homeowners. And so I am against that. I'm against giving my air rights for free to developers on the avenues to build taller buildings. I think that is wrong. It does not give us anything. We do not get any tax breaks for that. We do not get any money back for the value that we've lost. And so the best way to control our neighborhood is to slow down development by not allowing taller buildings and letting the six story, uh, the, the six story uh, uh, standard uh, prevail. And I'm, what is that phrase, upzoning for downzoning? Can you explain yes, that? Yes, in other words, upzoning for downzoning means that you're gonna allow larger buildings, taller buildings, you know, on the boulevards, on Utica, Nostrand, Church, uh, you know, Rogers, uh, Bedford, in exchange for, you know, having downzoned, taking away property air rights, uh, development rights from homeowners on the side streets, like where you and I live. I, I, am, I am fundamentally opposed to that concept. And what about the 80-20, what they call the Mitchell Llama, where the buildings are allowed to build a little higher, but they have to provide a public space like a park or a plaza. Well, you know, like that. anything that has to do. So, if, for example, we are not in an MIH community and so uh, in an MIH district. And, and so just break these acronyms. Ma down mandatory. People. We're not in a mandatory inclusionary housing area district. So, uh, you know, any upzoning that's provided is provided through mandatory inclusionary housing as a spot rezoning. And so, you know, again, I'm against that. We should build to the we should build to the uh, to the as of right standard that prevails in our community for for an R six, and we have to understand that our community is very attractive because we're essentially the last transit hub, you know, in Brooklyn. We're the last line, and so you know there is no there is nothing east of you know of us of the two and five, and until there is you know this area is going to be in very high demand because it's what's called the toad, a transit oriented orient transit oriented area development. And so we have to be sure to safeguard the value of our community uh, by slowing down the rate at which we develop. And I think that the rate that we have right now is adequate. What we need to do is really train uh, and, 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 and educate homeowners about how they retain the value of their properties and how they defend against development. Thank you so much, Anthony. Lou and I usually bump heads on certain things, but Lou knows that I'm with him on this, on this 100%. <laughs> you know, um, we've seen how many in our community, even um, current council has been, you know, as the term, term was, up zone to down zone, you know, that the attempt has been out there, you know, and there's been many fighting against that. Many organizations, many advocates, many community members, you know, it's, I call it, you know, bargaining with the devil. Oh, so, um, you ready, you know what's going to happen, you hope for the best, but it's going to happen, you know. But we definitely should not have any type of up zoning. We should stay away from the rezonings in our district. Um, okay, we, we um, you know, as we've seen other other um, communities when it comes to rezoning, it did not work out for the benefit of the community as well. You know, we have to protect our homeowners. You know, we have to protect the tenants. You know, who are who are um, tenants to the homeowners? You know, but then also we need to expand on the landmarking of our communities. Like we have the 300 block of East 25th. You know, with doing so, that literally protects us. We also need to make sure that this right now in the Senate, there's a cease and desist um, that piece of legislation. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Joseph's getting <laughs> his wings now as a timekeeper. Um, and we'll look for that 30 second uh, card also. Cyril, can you please tell us your thoughts about the zoning issue? Um, you need to unmute. You're muted now. And I'll just let you know that at the hour, we're going to take a little break and we're going to watch a very short two minute video about ranked choice voting, uh, just to give you something to look forward to to break up the dialogue. And then we'll come awesome. back for more questions. Cyril, are you ready to talk to us about zoning? I'm 100% in agreement with Lou on. Uh... Uh, where, where, where the zoning process is concerned. There is no such thing as MIR. And what we got to do is respect the wishes and the uh, demands of the EULA process. And what is that MIR, please? The minimum income range. And what is, and how is that related to this issue? 
the minimum income range related to the issue with housing. Because if, if you're telling me you're going to build housing, you're going to upgrade the, uh, upload the, uh, change the, house, the, the, the housing zone to build on air, right? So you're going to build a 15 or 16 story unit. And you are telling me affordable. There's no such thing as affordable. We have to go sustainable. That's where the MIR coming from. When the MIR came in, it was the minimum income range. Now, if you look at the residents of Community Board 17, which is mostly part of District 45, they're, they're um, living below the MIR. So we have to take that into consideration. Planning Board then said that they do not want to rezone. So we should respect that as Lucy respect it. Okay, thank you so thank much. You. That was really helpful to hear your, you know, to hear all of your input on that. So the next question that we're mm -hmm. gonna talk about um, is mental health. And it's something that I think is really important to people in this district. When I talk to people over and over again, they were very concerned about this. I talked to a woman in a hair salon and a woman had just randomly come into her salon and was just kind of almost, you know, threatening to assault her and she was very scared. And I talked to people who ride the subways and it's the same thing. They're encountering people with mental health issues and uh, substance abuse issues on a daily basis and they're uncomfortable and they're worried about their safety. I will say the one bright spot in terms of mental health was the New York State COVID-19 emotional support line. Uh, I know that I used it when I got COVID and on multiple occasions and found it to be really, really helpful. There were people there who helped me deal with my stress and my health issues. So what kind of programs are you anticipating to try to help people deal with this and, and move forward on this issue in our district? And we'll give a minute and a half each on this, please. Thank you. And we'll start with, uh, I think it's Cyril's turn to start. Yeah, mental health issues. I am, I am, I have said over and over that we need to put more resources into funding for mental health training and education. And I plan to expand on that, or fully fund mental health training and hire qualified people to deal with mental health issues. Because right now we're looking at mental health is on, on the rise, especially after suffering with COVID, COVID issue. So I am planning or, if elected, to put more discretionary funding into mental health programs. Okay, so funding? Um, yeah. That'd be great. And then uh, I'm just trying to keep our order here. Uh, Anthony, please. You know, mental health is a very serious topic in our community, um, you know, especially, well, we had, we had most of the issues that we're talking about tonight before COVID. And COVID definitely um, put more pressure to the stone. In regards to in regards to mental health, you know, we need to make sure, like, look at programs like Thrive that I truly feel didn't do just didn't do enough or do justice when it came to you know mental health outreach. We need to increase mental health outreach. We need to make sure that we have mental, more mental health professionals out there on mental health calls. We need to make sure that we have mental, you know the capacity to have mental health clinics within our community as well. Also, have social workers and counselors inside of our schools that deal with mental health because you know when people look at mental health they're only thinking about adults many of the times but they're not looking at the youth that really need us to have really struggling with the mental health issues that they do have you know walking about the community as i do every day you know i see it i hear it you know a lot of times you know through my you know through my practice and so like that you know of being able to take on you know different types of mental health training i've been able to help diffuse and the you know and de-escalate many situations but we need more of that. And we need to also make sure that our community-based organizations are able to provide that as well. Great. Lou, your thoughts? So uh, mental illness is a manifold problem in our community. And I think what everyone needs to understand is that mental illness is an industry in our community. And so, you know, it is it is it goes hand in glove with the, with the homelessness problem. And you can see it, you know, on all our major thoroughfares. Um, we do not solve the issue of mental illness with more funding. Thrive has plenty of funding and all that funding was wasted. And we don't know how that money was, how, how to, how that money uh, has been accounted for. And so, you know, I think that this is a, th this is an issue 
that goes much deeper. It, it has nothing to do with funding. It has to do with, again, absent leadership. All we have to do is really provide uh, the adequate structure for uh, people that are suffering from mental health to get the kind of uh, uh, attention that they need. I work with an organization called Children of Promise. And one of the things that we do uh, is provide free mental health clinicians to children in after school. And so we would bring a similar model here that would provide free clinicians and provide supportive housing and to provide medication to people that are suffering from mental illness so that they can work and lead productive lives. Thank you so much. It's great to hear the ideas on that. And uh, this is something else that I hear from people over and over again. The issues of sanitation, litter, the really, really <laughs> um, unsightly <laughs> piles of litter on our corners, on the streets, um, as well as things like parked cars that just stay there for days, uh, sanitation that doesn't come and pick up. We had no electronic recycling for like almost the entire pandemic. Um, and this is something I, I'm gonna sort of tie this into another issue, which is cooperation with other elected officials and with the community. We can't solve an issue like sanitation just in the district because some of the main thoroughfares go across multiple districts, especially like Church and Nostrand is between the 45th and the 40th district. So what is your plan for improving the sanitation and the litter in the community? And how are you going to work cooperatively with the community and with other council members? And we'll do two minutes each on this, please. Thank you. And we'll start with Anthony. Thank you for that question, Lulu. So yeah, so we have definitely seen the increase of uh, trash, but the decrease of trash pickups. Uh, what many don't, many in our communities don't understand is that in the last city budget, you know, not only did our council member, but other council members voted to actually cut the budget of sanitation. You know, um, and then even there's talks in the in city hall now to further cut the budget to sanitation, which means a loss of jobs, loss of hours, loss of pickups, loss of street cleaning. You know. It's, it's become a problem, you know, as Lou mentioned earlier with the trash in the tree beds, you know, that's where my, my campaign office is going down the stretch of Flatbush, you know, there's a consistent pile of trash, it's illegal dumping, you know, even along the Farragut corridor where we've cleaned up numerous occasions, but it keeps, it keeps occurring, you know, we need to bring about accountability, more accountability when it comes to about with illegal dumping, we need to fully fund our sanitation services, we need to make sure we hire more, and actually, you know, empower many community members to actually participate in sanitation pickups as well, too. You know, there's many organizations that said that if they had the funding, that they would actually expand what the community-based organization does to help pick up trash within the communities. You know, I'm gonna just I'm gonna push back on you a little bit on this because I'm a member yeah. of the Tilder Block Association, as is yeah. my husband. And we do, you know, the Tilder Block Association is known for going and doing litter pickup. We go oh, no, definitely. Up our block, Church Avenue, but honestly. It's not the community's responsibility. It's sanitation's job to pick yeah. up litter. And how are, in the same way that we're talking about police accountability, what mm. is your plan to hold sanitation accountable? Because literally when they did a walkthrough with us when, yeah. and we said there aren't enough trash cans, they said, oh, we don't put the trash cans out because the trash cans attract litter. So wow. we're not putting more <laughs> trash cans out. So this is kind of the, you know, this yeah. is the sort of uh, Orwellian, thinking that we're getting kind of backwards thinking that we're getting from sanitation how are you going to hold them accountable what are your plans no yeah so definitely yeah i do agree with that because i've had the same issue with um the homeowners off of king's highway where they were told to either adopt the can or they're told that they can't be provided with a can because it you know it, it attracts more trash we do we do need more trash cans um we fought hard to get trash cans on king's highway for the community members in that area, we need to do that in regards to, you know, more parts of our communities. We need to increase sanitation pickups. We need to make sure that they do their job and not just pick up in certain areas and don't pick up in other areas. We see the disparities. You know, we need to make sure that we truly hold them accountable. We need to hire more sanitation workers. We need to make sure that those who supervise these workers, you know, are actually make sure that the workers do their job. You know, we need to make sure that when it comes to the trash cans, if the trash cans, you know, bring in quote unquote, more trash, we need to make sure that they increase the pickups of that trash. You know, we've seen where they pick up the trash and then they throw the rest of the trash and then that also increases the litter on the block as well too. 
And how are you going to work with other council members to solve this and, problem? In regard in regards to that, you know, is making sure that we are able to fund some of these programs now to hire more people. You know, we need we need to hire more people, not only in sanitation, but many of these boot these um organizations that are contracted by the city to do block cleanups, especially like some that are on here on Flatbush. We see some on um on Church Avenue as well too with Wildcats and so forth to make sure that we're actually providing these jobs and providing, you know, an avenue for that we can have more cleanups in our community. Okay, but you're not actually answering my question. <laughs> so my question has to do with exactly. cooperation. And I'm going to actually put you on the spot a little bit here. Okay. So Farrah Lewis has said one of the reasons that she didn't participate in the forum is because she feels she's being harassed by your team. Mm -hmm. And she actually said that your team was pulling down her posters. So I don't, <laughs> I'd like you to give you a chance to respond to that and tie this into the idea of cooperation. If you're mm -hmm. having trouble working, you know, running a campaign where you have to navigate other council members, how are you going to be able to work collaboratively with other council members if you get elected as a city council member yourself? Well, the pushback against our false narrative that because our campaign has had numerous posters thrown down. Even yesterday, we've had a couple of, we had a business where our four by six banner was cut down from a business. You know, we've had, you know, banners pulled down from dollar vans. You know, we've been, we've had her, her mother come to our door and bang on our door and berate me in front of my nine-year-old daughter. You know, this is just a, you know, I would say a desperate attempt by a council member to not participate in many of these forums. It's not the first forum that our council member has not been in. You know, when she refused to take part in the Haitian Times um, um, debate, you know, she accused them of lying. Or her. She accused them of putting out four stories. You know, how many people have? How many people are guilty of this? And the council member is not being held accountable. You know, for her actions. You know, why does she have to keep on? You know, continue with a spin. In regards to working with other council members, you know, I've been working with other council members like um, Antonio Reynoso. Um, I've worked with you know council members throughout Queens and the Bronx to many initiatives that they needed as well too. I've always built what's what is called a cooperative group. Not just with elected officials, but also nonprofit and grassroots organizations. And that's one of the things that we look at to make sure that we do have a true sense of community for one accountability, but also empowerment. Because not only do the community members, you know, see what we're doing, but the youth actually repeat the things that they see out there. You know, so when we're out here, we're representing not just ourselves, we're representing the public in general. And with me being a father, a single father, of a nine-year-old daughter who's always with me. I show her the best examples out there and make sure she's around the people out there that actually show the best examples as well too, so that way she could grow up with that same mindset as well. Okay, well, thank you so much for addressing that. I really appreciate you just laying that out. That way people have both sides of the narrative and I think that's only fair. Lou, would you address the issue of actually working collaboratively and what your plans are specifically to clean up the litter and hold the sanitation department accountable? Thank you, Lulu. You know, I opened the segment here talking about this issue, and I, it's something that I, I, I is this constant critique. Uh, many of my colleagues in the political sphere have done plenty of neighborhood cleanups. And as I said before, you know, they never seem to find a solution to the problem. It's a problem that keeps recurring. And so, you know, uh, one thing that we can do is get the discretionary funding four fifths of which our council member is exporting outside of our community to address the trash issue. I wholeheartedly disagree with this idea that we should hire more people at sanitation when we don't have the budget to do that. You know, and so where I see opportunity, where I see a problem, I see opportunity. And so I hope we get a chance to talk about this a little later, right? There is a bid in, at the junction that whose responsibility is to make sure that they clean up, you know, our neighborhood. That bid is failing. And I want to talk about HOAs, homeowner associations. And I want to talk about how we turn uh, sanitation in our community into an entrepreneurial enterprise. And I think you will get buy-in from other from neighboring districts because you will, you know, you will solve the problem by creating new businesses and by uh, and by and by offering jobs. And those jobs are you know dignified jobs that will give you know our businesses. Uh, clean sidewalks will allow us to, you know, to to enjoy our community and will allow us to want to invest in our community. Right now, you don't have that. And so, you know, uh, what we need is different thinking. This is not about funding. 
And you can't fund your way. You can't ask the city to fund your way out of the problems. This is about creativity and ingenuity. And this is about project management. Most of the people that have done neighborhood cleanups can't fix the problem. They can't finish the job. They just don't have the tools to do it. I do. And so, you know, I plan on making this a project. I plan on making it a self-sustaining solution that will have lasting impact on our community. It's the small thing and I can solve the small thing before I get to the bigger thing, which is making sure that we have a dignified place to do business and commerce, create jobs, right? And create opportunity and prosperity in our community. And what about working cooperatively with other council members? Is that something that you feel that you're gonna be able to do, Lou? Absolutely. I mean, I think I'm uh, very capable and very persuasive. I can work with other council members. You know, I have no, I, I, I've never had any challenges, you know, uh, collaborating with others because that's part of, you know, my, that's part of my training. That's part of my, my MO. You know, I'm trained to resolve conflict. I'm trained to come to the middle, to find compromise, to, you know, to, to make sure that, uh, that whatever, you know, uh, that we put our clients first, you know, we want to put our clients and their needs first. The community is our client. Uh, our business owners are our client, and we want to make sure that our client get our clients get what they deserve, so that they can do so that they can go about their business and 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 make sure that our community prospers. Okay. And so that will be my per, that will be my first priority. Thank you so much. And Cyril, what are your ideas about how to hold sanitation accountable, and will you be able to work collaboratively with other council members to do that? Let me let me answer this for the. Uh... Last question first. Would I, how could I work with city council members across the aisle? My philosophy or my method is working with across the aisle and reaching all city council members. Why? For all city council members are Brooklynites and they live in New York. And the problem is not just in my council district. The problem is in all the city council districts. Now, for instance, we have in, I will hold sanitation department responsible because we have in these white sanitation buses, pick up garbage, they mark BK, BK 17, then BK 4, and they pass garbage on the streets. They don't pick it up. So my philosophy or my method is to have sanitation commissioner let or enforce that any time BK-17 or BK-4, BK-3 passing BK-6, they see garbage, pick it up. It's not garbage, it's sanitation responsibility to keep our streets clean. So if you're telling me you see about three or four BK-17 buses passing down and they see garbage in BK-3, they won't pick it up. Why are you driving my buses, paying you per hour, and not picking up the garbage? You see garbage, you guys want to pick up. That is my first thing. Try. All right, so I'm not Hello? sure I completely understand that plan. When you say the buses are going to pick up the garbage, are you talking about sanitation buses? Or are you talking about, oh, you're talking about, you know, yes, basically, yes. so your plan is to have sanitation buses throughout the city, just be more comprehensive and pick up garbage wherever they see it. Yes. Okay, yes. so we had three different approaches there. And I think that's helpful for people to really hear. You each had a distinct plan about approaching it. Uh, you were saying you do more comprehensive collection from the buses. Lou has a different strategy in terms of just really approaching things philosophically differently. And Anthony is interested, I think he said, in funding the sanitation department and getting more people out there, especially doing that job and working with the community. So I'm just, those are just quick summaries, but each of you had an, an interesting approach and I appreciate you sharing those. So we're gonna take a quick break now and look at a video. And the um, it's a video about ranked choice voting. So the, type of voting that we're gonna be doing in this particular election coming up is different than we have in the past. It's called ranked choice voting. And many people are already familiar with it, but in case people aren't, I wanna just play a video for you. And this was made by the New York City Campaign Finance Board. And it talks about how we're gonna be voting this time. And it's just about two minutes long. So I think it'll be a nice break for us also just from the, uh, um, from the dialogue and then we'll- come back and, and answer some more questions uh, and hopefully take some questions from the audience. So here's our um, 
here's our video about ranked choice voting. And this, as I said, is from the Campaign Finance Board of New York City. The elections. A way that gives... There's a new way for New Yorkers to have their say in city elections. A way that gives voters more choices and can lead to more diverse winners. It's called ranked choice voting. 74% of New York voters chose to use it in primary and special elections for city offices, mayor, public advocate, comptroller, borough president, and city council. You won't see ranked choice voting in general elections or elections for state or national offices. But in ranked choice voting elections, you can now rank up to five of your favorite candidates for each office. Here's how ranked choice voting works. On your ballot, you'll see candidates listed in rows and numbered rankings and columns. Pick your first choice and completely fill in the oval next to their name under the first column. Like always, you can just vote for your one favorite candidate and submit your ballot. But you might like several people. If you have a second choice, fill in the oval next to their name under the second column. Do the same thing for your third, fourth, and fifth choices if you have them. A few don'ts. Don't rank the same candidate more than once. It won't help them, and it takes away your chance to rank the others who are running. Don't give the same rank to multiple candidates. It could disqualify your ballot. Don't worry. This is a new process, and you can always ask a poll worker for help or for a new ballot if you make a mistake. So how do ballots get counted with ranked choice voting? If one candidate gets more than 50% of everyone's first choice votes, they win the election right away. That's it. If no candidate gets more than 50%, ballots will be counted in rounds. Round by round, the candidate with the fewest votes is eliminated. So if your top rated candidate is eliminated, your vote goes to your next highest choice. This keeps going until only two candidates remain. The person with the most votes wins. Ranked choice voting is already popular in many cities around the country because voters find that it helps more voices be heard. Now it's our turn. Get answers to your questions and learn more at nyccfb.info slash rcv. Okay, so that's our ranked choice voting uh, break. So I hope that was helpful and informational. The election day is actually June 22nd and there's gonna be early voting prior to that. And you also have the option to vote by mail. And if you're, gonna, if you're not registered yet, the deadline to register to vote for the primary is May 28th. So make sure that you do get your registration in by May 28th at the latest. Send it right away if you're not registered to vote yet. Um, so we're gonna go back to our questions now. And I hope that was like a nice little break. Um, and the next question that we're gonna talk about is discretionary spending. And we're just gonna spend a minute each on this. Um, Lou started to bring it up and I think it's good that we talk about it. And um, it did, so um, Lou, why don't you go ahead and lead us off in this and just talk, the, we did have articles from the Haitian Times and people may or may not have read them. The, the each city council person gets a discretionary budget. And one of the things that the Haitian Times reported was that a good deal of the discretionary budget from our city council person who is Farrah Lewis is currently going outside the district. It was actually $1.4 million that they reported was going outside the di district as opposed to I think around um, a quarter of a million dollars in the district. So it was a very strong discrepancy. So Lou, <clears throat> how would you spend the discretionary spending? And um, I am also gonna just try to loop into this some other things that people particularly asked me about when I was out and about in the district. People asked, especially about the public school curriculum. Why isn't it as good as the private school curriculum? About after school programs, um, especially for financial literacy, um, after school programs for entrepreneurship, civics programs, you know, you see kids and they are so disengaged and they don't even wanna vote. Um, so, uh, computer literacy programs for seniors. Can the discretionary spending help us on some of these really important areas where we're lagging behind? And we'll spend a minute and a half on this. Thank you. That's a little, very little time to do that, so I'll do my best. But okay. the discretionary funding that we currently have, four-fifths of that money is being sent outside the district. So I would use that money to, as, as a catalyst 
to help create the kinds of programs that we need in this community, which are providing direct services to our to our residents, right? Uh, I opened the program, uh, the section talking about, you know, my three priorities, vocational training for 12 to 18 year olds after school between the hours of three and 7 p.m. that would allow parents time to leave their kids in a safe place, learning a skill. I would use discretionary funding to, to create public private partnerships to help fund those programs. And I would work very closely with uh, non the nonprofit community that's already doing that work. And so, you know, I would use that money to, to catapult those programs and have the city, uh, and, and once those programs are, are vetted, have the city invest in those programs and, and scale them if they work. And so, you know, the discretionary uh, funding is a great instrument if it's used wisely. I deal with budgets every day. Uh, it's just part of my job. And so, you know, it, it's easy for me to use the money that's that's allocated to help, you know, create and uh, create programs that will give us a return on investment. Right now, we're just throwing that money away. Thank you so much. Very efficient. Well done. Cyril, what are your ideas about discretionary spending? And can you address some of these needs that people were talking about when they, um, you know, when I as when I was out in the community, the specific ones I listed. Uh, discretionary fund. The discretionary spending. We lost Cyril. I'm not sure what happened. Well, maybe Anthony can answer in the meantime. Sure, Anthony, do you want to go? It's definitely um as as Lou said, you know. Much of the discussion, and as you stated, most of the in Haitian Times has put out there, most of the discretionary funding we have lost in this community, $1.4 million sent out of our community, to, you know, our community, especially the community based organizations. So, um, most of the organizations were already providing the needs, you know, for the community, you know, um, and we do need to expand when it comes to education on bringing back vocational training back to the, you know, back to our schools, you know. But then also we need trade schools back in our community as well too. You know, we need to make sure that we have affordable to, you know, free to affordable after school programs for our youth and also summer programs. I remember going to uh, Project Concern at mile 11, I still had to travel two buses to get there, but I was able to get there, you know, during the summer to be able to provide with mentorship, you know, learn um, different type of skills, learn how to be a peer mediator. I even learned how to play tennis, you know, our youth are not even provided with this opportunity to stay in age because there seems to be more of an investment in mass incarceration of our youth instead of education of, for our youth. You know, and we have to make sure that we invest in our youth because those are the next right. leaders in our community, especially when the council member who spent the $1.4 million out of the district also voted for $11 billion to be used to build four new jails in our city and also cut the funding of a, cru a crucial organization that caters to over a thousand youth in our community, you know, just because a former director of that organization ran against her in 2019. That's um, not the type of politics we need. We need politics that is community-based and that is prioritizing the people, especially our youth. Thank you so much. Cyril, did we get you back? Let's see if he's here. I'm not sure what happened. His screen went black. So I think we're going to just have to keep moving forward. <laughs> and um, why don't we do this? Uh, we'll see if he uh, gets, I'm not seeing him anywhere in the, um, in the online. So we'll, uh, I'd like to take some questions from the audience um, as a little bit of a break also. So if there's people who have a specific question, um, would you like to put it into the chat? And um, I'll ask one more question while people do that. Uh, so this will, I think this will tie into the question that we just had in terms of education. What are your specific plans in terms of, one thing that I heard is that the public education curriculum is just not competing with the private education curriculum. And what are your specific plans to improve that? And I will shout out those programs again. I heard over and over again, financial literacy, um, entrepreneurship and civics. Uh, Lou, do you wanna go? Sure. Uh, first, I believe that our public schools are failing. We have a 60% fail rate in our public schools. If I had it, I, having anyone who has the resources and chooses not to send uh, their child to public school, 
would be doing their child an incredible service. Not most people in our community do not have that possibility. And so I believe that charters are a much better you know, alternative to, uh, to our public school dilemma. And I think that we need to have charter administrations within our public schools. We can see what happened to uh, Romy uh, Saint uh, at a public school. I think that's disgraceful. I would not send my child to a public school here uh, you know, if I could avoid it. And so I know many other parents feel the same. Uh, the New York City public school uh, system is the most segregated school system in the country. And so we need to find ways to retool the public school system and starve the beast. I believe very uh, adamantly in, in divesting from you know, public schools that are failing uh, in our community and, and substituting them with charter schools. And I know to the, that that is you know, a heresy you know, uh, to many, but if you're a parent and you're sending, and that is your only choice, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the reality is that schools are bankrupting our community. And so, you know, if you have kids graduating without skills, those, you know, they are not benefiting their homes. They are not investing in their homes. And that is why you see uh, such great, uh, you know, uh, uh, economic uh, strain in our community because you have people that are not working, that don't have skills. And, you know, we're, we're losing homes at an alarming rate because people cannot afford the homes that they live in. And so part of solving the, you know, the generationally part of solving the, the, the uh, foreclosure crisis in our community, it has, a, it has a direct link to, you know, the quality of education that our students are receiving and, you know, the generational, uh, the generational uh, 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 damage that has been done is evident on our streets. You see it every day with you know, violence, you see it every day with, you know, with bullying, you see it every day with, you know, with uh, unemployment, with uh, mass incarceration. And education is the only way to solve that problem. Okay, thank you so much. So lose in favor of charter schools. And Anthony, do you agree or disagree with that? I truly feel that many that the charter school system has actually been, you know, taken away the bricks of our, from our public schools. You know, that's been a huge problem. You know, they, it, it seemed like it's the best resort because they leave you with the options that that's their only resort instead of actually putting the services and resources that are needed within our public schools. I'm a public school child, you know, child, you know, all the way, you know, all through high school. I went to PS 135. I went to went through high school. I graduated from Midwood High School, you know, and, and the thing is that I didn't see any um, lack of education or opportunities to me, but what it is, as the years pass, there has been more funding taken out of the education, educational system. So even the state has just finally paid out the funding that has owed our New York City schools, which is over $1.4 billion. But you know, over the past seven years, they've owed this money. They lost in a lawsuit. You know, but it's a shame that we had to fight for it. But you know, I do agree with Lou on this situation where funding is not just the key. We need the resources and services. We need to bring a lot of these programs that are outside the community or even those who have not been created yet, create them in our community and bring them into our schools to teach financial literacy, to teach coding, you know, to, you know, bring them like organizations like Girl Code, where my daughter learned to code over the, you know, two summers ago, you know, just by uh, um, attending four to five classes, bring that into our schools. You know, we have to have the resources and the services for it. We can't just say, you know, here you go, good luck. Is that we see there's disparities when it comes to our schools compared to the schools in more affluent communities. You know, there's, there's disparities when it comes to the funding and funding that is also raised. You know, we need to make sure that we have equity across the board. Our city council has failed at that time and time again. They've given us nothing but lip service. They truly have failed our youth. You know, it's not the community that has done that. It's the powers that be in legislation that have failed to prioritize our youth, that, priority, that failed to prioritize the budget, because even this, this last budget, they cut funding to music and arts. Like, you know, they, they already cut funding to so much in the schools already. You know, what, it's like, like I said, they seem to be focused more on investing in mass incarceration than they are in education. You know, okay. Thank you so much. I mean, it's no, wrap you, <laughs> you had a lot of really interesting ideas there. So a different opinion from Lou, support for the public schools and bringing in outside innovators into the schools. Interesting. Cyril, and what are your plans for education? And I'm sorry, I forgot to give a time limit on this, but um, the other gentleman took around two minutes. So why don't you please take that? And you'll have to unmute yourself. You're muted right now, but welcome back, by the way. 
um, you're going to need to unmute. Yes, I'm. I'm sorry, I had some difficult, some technical problems with the uh, last question you asked. But what was the question you asked me now? Um, I'm asking you about education. What are your plans for education to improve the public school systems, especially to provide financial literacy, entrepreneurship, and civics classes? Okay. My plan for education is to invest more money into the educational system, hire and train more qualified teachers, and just don't, let's just don't think about the three C teachers, clock, calendar, and cash. Because when you have your, your kids go to school, you are depending on the teachers to give your kids proper education. And if we continue, guess high end pillars not qualified, or don't give a D about my ch your children, it doesn't make no sense. Because as, a, as an educator, we should invest more money into our schools. Okay, and are you and, thinking a uh, higher um, salaries for teachers or more yes, teachers, yes. lower size classrooms, all of that? Yes, ma'am. Yes, that's what I'm planning on doing. Okay, thank you okay. so much. So it's great to hear yes. those ideas. And yes. now we have a, a question from somebody. They said, ranked choice voting, what happens to your vote if one of your candidates is ranked the lowest, but is ranked the lowest, but not your first choice candidate? I'm not sure I completely understand what they're asking there. If one of your Anthony, did you want to field that? Yes, I, I think they're asking about, you know, if, if um, what happened to the other candidates, but it's, you know, so the way even the video showing, I've, I've done a lot of ranked choice voting um, workshops throughout the whole pandemic. You know, um, if, you're ranked, if your first choice happens to, you know, not make it, you know, your second choice happens to be, you know, somebody else's choice, you know, it, it's basically a process of elimination, you know, so, you know, make sure you rank accordingly. Uh, make sure that you choose, you know, who your truly first choice is going to be, your second choice, your third choice, and fourth choice is going to be in this race here. Okay, I hope that answered your question. Andrea, let us know if that answered your question. And uh, we're going to move on and we're going to ask now about traffic issues. This is something that uh, is really important to the Tilder Block Association. We had, um, it was described to me how a speeding car came down East 32nd Street and missed the stop sign, went full speed into a car that was parking and totaled that person's car. It was the person's brother who talked to me about it, Russell on, on Tilden. What are you going to do to improve the safety? Can we get speed bumps? Can we get better signs, better enforcement? Anthony, will you start please? Definitely, I had, and I'm sorry, I didn't give the time limit, but we have we need to be aware of our time. Let's do just a minute on this, please. Okay. Okay. Thank yes, you. Yes, definitely. Um, I've actually I've had a, a couple of conversations with homeowners, you know, on on the block on East Thirty Second, and they felt that you know they were ignored. You know, we do need speed bumps that stretch. We also need a traffic light as well. You know, uh, one of the homeowners told me, "Why does it just seem like everybody looks at Thirty First, but not Thirty Second? You know, they felt the, you know they felt abandoned." You know, so definitely, you know, we need to put speed bumps there. We need to put more traffic enforcement and we need to make sure that we are able to put um, street lights there as well, too. Thank you so much, Lou. I believe in urban design. And so, you know, one of the things that I think we do need to do is change the texture of the streets that we're concerned about, particularly on the cross streets that are wide, like Beverly, Tilder, Snyder, uh, you know, certainly Clarendon, which are wide streets. And we need to make sure that uh, cars drive slower. Also, uh, generally, I think we need to move away from car culture. And so, you know, I think I do not own a car. I, my, my primary means of transportation is biking. And so bike lanes are also a great way of slowing traffic down. Thank you. And Cyril? Yes, definitely. I will, I will work with the uh, block association, and associations to get more speed bumps within this trip. Quite, go through most of the district and there are no speed bumps. We need speed bumps and the block association or tenant association has a voice if they come together and lobby the city, the, the, the politician to push the process faster than if they go in by themselves. So we need speed bumps and traffic lights. Yes, we do. Thank you so much. And Lou, I'm just going to pop back to you. I just, I, I have to say I'm a little bit confused. So you were saying more about working with design, but what does that mean and how does that address the speed issue? So the speed issue is really, you know, uh, is really due to the fact that, you know, we have, 
wide streets that bisect our district. And so because we have, you know, asphalt, we don't have something like speed bumps or that, you know, effectively creates a texture when you drive, you know, people are, and, and few traffic lights in between, people are compelled to speed. And so, you know, what we need to do is what we've done in other countries is they change the texture of the road. So one example is, for example, if you've ever been to Soho, they have cobblestone streets and the cobblestone streets force cars to go slower. You know, other design elements like bike lanes or narrowing the amount of space that cars have in order, you know, in order to, to maneuver is a good way to slow traffic down. And so I think the principles of, you know, of street design need to be fully applied, you know, in our district and, 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 and striping needs to be, you know, used more effectively to create the effect of narrower lanes so that cars will slow down. But I'm just going to push back on you a little bit because sure. literally here on East 32nd Street, I don't see that they're going to go and put cobblestones on our street. No, okay, I mean, it was, a, it, it, so, it was an example, but, right. you know, certainly, certainly speed bumps would work, you know, um, other, there are other, there are other surface texturing, you know, devices that, that would work. Um, traffic lights and stop signs, of course. But I mean, really, this is an, this is a urban design street design problem. But you and are I open to it, pushing for speed bumps for the communities that work. Oh, sure. But I'm also okay. open to, I'm also open to other alternatives. Okay, super. Thank you so much. And let's, as long as we're on subjects that are uh, close to Tilder's heart, let's talk about open space, the gardens. Uh, this is a community that's known for its gardening. We've received awards for our tree beds and we received the first sustainability award for, uh, from the uh, Brooklyn Botanical Gardens. Um, so I think Anthony, it's your turn to start and tell us how you would create open spaces. We really need more parks uh, and how you would support our gardens. And we'll spend a minute and a half on this, please. Thank you. There's definitely, we do need more gardens. We do need to protect um, green space, even our AstroTurf uh, space we need to protect. You know, um, we need as much green space as possible. Um, even when you look at Tilden Playground, where they originally were going to dig into um, back in 2017, I believe, we can actually put green space there as well in the, in the open section that is near the tennis court. So um, we, have a, we have a lot of um, open areas where we can put community gardens in. You know, we could even implement rooftop gardens as well, too. You know, these are things that not only provide, uh, you know, healthier, you know, um, community for us, but it also helps us combat against, you know, climate change. Well, you know, it, 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 brings, it brings a lot of changes that we do need. We've seen it in many other um, districts. You know, if, you know, we look at Sunset Park. You know, if you look at the battle that's going on with, um, with Brooklyn Botanical Garden, you know, led by many of the advocates out there, you know, we need to protect our green spaces. We need to bring in more. We need to make sure that we also teach our children about the importance of green spaces, you know, and have them ha lend a hand in it. I've seen that example actually in Bed-Stuy and Bushwick over the summer as well, you know, and I was very thrilled to see that because that meant it built a sense of community, but it also meant more community involvement and investment in the community as well too. Nice, Cyril, what are your thoughts about how you're gonna provide more open space and more and support the gardening here, please? Well, I am, I am proud that you asked that question because I'm the director of a Motor Community Garden for over 13 years. I also was the director of Linden Bush Community Garden, Secret Garden. And I'm working with Green Thumb Parks, Parks, City Parks Foundation. And the way that we're going to support it is to get community members involved, those that really care about the community. During the COVID time, we had the uh, after school program in here, where myself, Amy, and other people came in and helped kids learn, teach them, open up the garden for arts and culture. Build more beds. When I took over Motor Garden, there was eight beds in there. And now we have 38. And the demand is growing. And that's why I see I spend more time in the garden at times because you must keep up keep the garden. And if the garden is not up kept, you go to Green Thumb, go to City Parks, go to uh, Green Gorillas and ask for support because I got, just got a fund, building capacity fund. In, for two thousand five hundred dollars from for, for my garden, and all that money is going to bring kids in, teach them ecology, teach them how to plant and grow. That's why I'm going to support it, and I will make sure that I put some of my discretionary funding into bring, keeping our garden clean because that's the best thing you could eat. Wonderful! That sounds great. 
Okay, That's Cheryl, my heart. thank you for that. Yes, Lou, yes. What are your thoughts about more open space? How are we going to get it? How are we going to fund it? And how are we going to keep supporting our gardens? So one of the great, you know, uh, one of the great uh, disappointments during this COVID crisis is that we haven't had open streets in our district and no one's been advocating for it, which I think is terrible. Uh, you know, that's one way to create more public space. And as part of, you know, as a, as a council member, one thing that I plan to do is create, you know, Saturday and Sunday open streets all year round. And uh, what does I that also, mean exactly, open streets? Open streets is, you know, when you close off certain streets and you or you allow them, you know, to be used only by the public and you close them to vehicular traffic for a spe uh, specified blocks of time uh, during uh, the weekend. And so that would encourage kids and parents to come out into the streets, you know, and use the streets as, as playgrounds um, because we don't have a lot of ready access to, you know, uh, large parks in our community. I have to walk a considerable distance, you know, to get to, you know, a park. So, you know, it's, it's really effective if we, you know, if we use the streets. Uh, another thing is that, as I said earlier, one of the things that is near and dear to Tilder Block Association are the tree beds. And, you, you know, your efforts have not been matched uh, by the commitment of the council member to really scale you know, those kinds of programs. So the discretionary funding needs to be used to create more awareness about, you know, what neighbors can do for neighbors. I be, I'm a big composter. I believe in, you know, in educating kids, you know, about, about the benefits of, you know, of planting. And so, you know, that's something that I plan on supporting, you know, as, as well as community gardens. I think, you know, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no, uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, there's no, uh, um, I'm, uh, yeah. There's no reason not <laughs> well, to do it. Okay, but let me, I, I'm just, I'm actually a little bit surprised to hear you as an architect not talk more about how to use design in this element to reclaim mm -hmm. abandoned buildings or parking lots and turn those into green, green spaces. Space. Because yes. it's a little bit different. I understand about opening streets and having kids there without cars. It's not the same as interacting with a tree or with like learning, teaching him how teaching kids how to garden. What about using your design skills to actually innovate and create more open spaces? Well, I mean, I think that that's a great question. Uh, again, to accomplish that, you know, you need to have negotiating skills where you can bargain with private landowners, right? So these buildings are owned by somebody and we need to be able to work with those people so that we can have, you know, more access to those spaces and use them in an efficient and creative way. You know, so I, again, you know, yes, there are plenty of design discussions. I don't have a lot of time to discuss them, but, you know, there are plenty of options to create, you know, more effective green spaces in our community. There are more ways to, you know, use the public space that we have more effectively, you know, uh, in a design capacity so that we have more access to open space for our children and our families. I mean, of course, there's nothing controversial about that. And would you fight for it? Of course I would fight for it. Great. Okay. I think, I mean, clearly it's a real priority for Tilder and oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, and we've yes, seen how wonderful that mm -hmm. is for kids when they start gardening and when they really come in contact with it, even any community, they've shown how even people in prison facilities, when they start gardening, have used all kinds of transformative experiences there. It's so very therapeutic to them. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So I appreciate the ideas that you had there. I love that rooftop garden idea that Anthony had. Um, I'm going to pivot a little bit to, oh, I want to ask one more thing. Can any of you talk about the Shirley Chisholm Community Center? Um, if you would move it forward, it seems like it's been sort of in planning stages for a long time. And I particularly would like to see that, uh, that they would make a swimming pool there, which is a great thing for a neighborhood. Cyril, you're on camera, so why don't you start with that one? And we'll just yes. talk about this very briefly, like 30 seconds. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm glad you brought the Chisholm uh, Community Center because this, this is one of the things I spoke to uh, Greg Carnegie when he was running for office because that's in his district. And right now you have Robert Waterman who is also running for that district. Charlie Chisholm is just closed down and then and doing. We should invest in that. Make something better out of it because that's a historical place. And if I'm elected, I'm going to work with whoever that city council member for this district to put funding and bring it back to what it's supposed to be. Okay, um, thank you so much, it, Anthony. Yes, so the Shirley Chisholm um, Community Center was first um, presented by Jamani Williams for the Tilden Playground. 
um, a, a lot of pushback from homeowners because it was more uh, built, you know, they were folk, they were scared about it being built up because they'll lose sunlight. Um, then the current council member and initiated plans for over here by North Shore Playground, but there's already like a great space there. There's many areas where we could actually have a community center. Matter of fact, we could have multiple community centers if we really put our minds to it. So that way we're not, you know, we're not the cause of disparities across the district because this is a very large district. Um, we, oh, okay. I'm sorry, just finish up your thoughts there. Joseph was on it today. Um, <laughs> No, so yeah, so we definitely we definitely need to stop with the lip service of Shirley Chisholm Community Center and actually make it happen and start breaking ground from now. Thank you so much, Lou. Yes. Again, you know, incredibly mismanaged process that that design that building was designed and already you know partially uh you know uh, uh, procured. Uh, now they changed locations and they're starting the design process again. Money has been spent and will continue to be spent talking about this community center that will never materialize. And what we need to do is use that money to invest in spaces that we already have in our district and, you know, in, in the churches that, you know, are sp waste spaces that are going to waste to function as community centers. And, you know, if we had the money and we had the means to create a community center, you know, we should have designed it and located it with community buy-in from the beginning. And we don't have that. It's again, wasted process, wasted money, wasted opportunities. We don't have, we don't have critical thinking in our leadership. It's, it shows, you. it's so clear. Thank you so much. Those are really, really great points. And if any of you get selected, I also do hope you'll remember to try to get a swimming pool for our neighborhood. That's a wonderful thing for children and adults. Well, a swimming, pool, a swimming pool at the, a proposed location is all you really need to do. <laughs> <laughs> Real quick, be, well, well, yeah, being, a Marine, uh, very quickly, being a Marine, Anthony. being a Marine that when I got in the Marine Corps, swimming was one of the qualifications, you know, definitely we need to teach our youth how to swim. You know, I had, I had to do my swim call twice just to be able to get, you know, I got to a high level, but we definitely need that. We need more. We need Great. more for our youth. Great. Cyril? Swimming pool is number one on my priority for, for District 45. Great. Why believe in swimming? And I like to train people how to swim. Life saving. And you start at a swimming pool. So definitely you are going to get a swimming pool. Whether I'm elected or not, I'm going to work with whoever is there to try and get a swimming pool in there. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna be in touch with it. you about that. I'm gonna follow yes, up. Yes, I with am. You. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That's great. Yes, I love to swim definitely. and I I miss it since I've been in this neighborhood. Okay. Um, let's, and I think that's actually a good pivot point to talk about climate change, because obviously with climate change coming, seas rising, it is something, a survival skill, uh, as Anthony said. So um, I'm, I think Cyril started last time. I am trying to be fair in terms of the order. So I think Anthony, you're up to bat to start. Just, uh, we don't have, we're running out of time here. So just okay. like a minute on how are you going to help the city think forward and prepare for climate change? We have to think about it. So definitely, um, I know um, many of our current council members, like Antonio Reynoso, has been the champion when it's come to many um, when it comes to the climate change issue. So I definitely want to continue since he's termed out. I want to continue with many of his pieces of legislation from the rooftop gardens to expanding green spaces to save our current green spaces to make sure that we educate the community more about climate change to make sure that we provide the community with more protections. Um, and, and not even just our community, but the city in general. You know, with, with, with all that's going on, especially when it comes to the waterfront, you know, and that doesn't mean give these developers all access to this waterfront. No, that means we need to actually protect the waterfront so that we tenants who are already there can actually be protected and not displaced. Thank you so much. That was perfect in timing. Okay. And um, Lou? Yeah, so one of the things that I want to propose as a council member is that I want New York City to be a leader in, you know, climate action. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to propose is that all products that come to, you know, our New York City supermarkets that currently use plastic be replaced with plastic or with paper or paper wax products. So, you know, I want to eliminate uh, plastics from the New York City, you know, retail diet altogether. Right. And so that's going to be a monumental step, something that I think I can work with other council members to achieve uh, and will add to the already aggressive, uh, you know, climate stance that New York City has taken on buildings. We have local law 97 which is in effect in 2024, you starting to see letter grades in buildings. If you have a D or a C letter grade, you will be taxed for carbon emissions, 
which is you know innovative and on its, of itself and is moving the needle on climate change significantly in New York City. Thank you so much. And Cyril, how are you going to lead on climate change? On climate change, I will try my best to lead by trying to to uh, encourage or get funding for more people to go solo. That's number one. For more people to what? To go solo, solar panels instead of this. Oh, solar, yes. Yes, okay, solar. So funding for solar panels, great. Yes, because, because I'm having one in my garden right now, I'm building. That will stop the climate change. Now, if we look at the, the different uh, weather, the way it changes is, we need to hold the federal government, work with them to get more funding, to educate people on how to divert from climate change. Great. So take resources, also work with the federal government. Yes. Uh, yes. And let me just ask each of you also about another thing that's been a concern to me. What about re-examining the floodplain maps, since obviously sea change levels are going to affect those, and starting programs for flood insurance for homeowners? Is that something that each of you um, might have thought about, Cyril? Yes, yes, I've, I've thought about it already. Yes, definitely. And is and is one on my manifesto on what I'm going to do. I don't do expand too much on it because I don't feel take my ideas and run with it. But <laughs> okay, patent that one, <laughs> Anthony. Uh, floodplain changes and flood insurance. Yes, that def def definitely support it. Um, you know, because there, there's a increase in danger, like I said, to the, to the waterfront, and even within you know certain range of the blocks within there, we've seen what's happened with the past storms that we've had. And it's devastating. People are still literally rebuilding their homes to this day, you know, and have not received any type of assistance, any type of funding, any type of help. So we need to make sure that when we are talking about protecting the people, protecting all New Yorkers. Well, Lou? I don't think uh, anyone really understands, you know, paying lip service to this issue that this is a federal issue. The FEMA flood maps are, you know, extremely controversial. Uh, you know, when we're talking about insurance and money, there is no two greater evils. And so, you know, when we're talking about design resiliency so that we can use, you know, uh, the uh, properties that we have at, that are in the floodplain more effectively, I think that that's the way to go forward. Uh, I don't think anyone here has the capacity or the understanding to really manage the FEMA flood map issue, uh, especially as it, you know, pertains to, you know, insurance companies and their, you know, and their lobbies. This is just, you know, pie in the sky. We have to figure out a way to design better and to make sure that we build in resiliency uh, at the, you know, at, at the, at the, um, at the areas where we have exposure. And that's something that we have to do. We have to invest in as a city. And so, you know, I'm looking forward to building resiliency, but I'm not messing with the FEMA flood maps. No, I want to make any promises that we could do that. Thank you. Very informative. I really appreciate all of your answers on that. I'm going to pivot to something that is dear to my heart. Uh, I run a nonpartisan project called Smart Elections. And uh, our main goals are to, um, our mission statement is elevating election reform to an urgent national priority. And I'm an election security journalist and I've studied election security for over 10 years. And we have some very bad voting machines coming into the state. Security experts say they actually, if hacked, can add, change, or delete votes on individual ballots. They could be quite risky. And uh, New York City actually already asked permission to use them in 2019 because our New York City election, uh, our executive director of the New York City Board of Elections has a very um, long standing relationship with one of the vendors, ESNS. He was on a what they called a sort of secret advisory committee where he was wined and dined, flown around the country. So we know that there are some corruption issues there. And we know that traditionally in New York, there have been issues of cronyism and even accusations of ballots being potentially not counted correctly. There's actually a civil case moving forward uh, that has charges of corruption. So here in our, our district. So what are each of you going to do to try to reform the Board of Elections, reduce cronyism and make sure that anybody who wants to participate and have public oversight can do that. So reform of the Board of Elections. And Lou, do you wanna start this one? Sure, and I wanna applaud you. I wanna begin by applauding your work uh... With election security, you know, I follow uh, a lot of your commentary. Uh, it's it's very it's very high, you know, uh, stuff. And so I wanted to address the, the the voting security issue locally as one that really has to do with more voter outreach, more training, more understanding about you know what's at stake 
and how people vote, right? So early voting, I think is important. Uh, I think it is important to get more people, uh, you know, to explore different types of, of, uh, of voting uh, methods and uh, move away from, you know, our, our dependence on voting machines and voting lobbies. So, you know, I think that voting is a very, as we've seen in the last election, uh, you know, and as we've seen as in places like Georgia, I think, uh, you know, voting is, some, is, is, is often weaponized and it's used to confuse uh, the electorate. And so, you know, if you have, uh, the, the harder you make it, the more heady you make it, the more difficult it is for people to understand. I applaud your work, uh, you know, with electric security. I think that we need to be vigilant about the kinds of technology that we're allowing uh, to be used in New York City. And the only way to do that is to educate people and continue the work that you do, elevate the work that you do to make sure that this is something that's comprehensible to people. And are you willing to take on the Board of Elections and work to try to reform the crony? I think, I think happening? the Board of Elections, I think the Board of Elections is, needs to be reformed. Uh, I also want to say parenthetically that I think there's a lot of committed people that are currently working in the Board of Elections. And there's a lot of, you know, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, legacy knowledge in there. And so, you know, we want to make sure that we, we, we don't, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We need to go and we need to go to we, we need to go to bat for you know voters and we need to make sure that the the changes that need the structural changes that need to happen within the board of elections is done efficiently and managed in a in a, in a civil process. Great, Anthony. And why don't we spend? I'm sorry, I didn't give a time on this one also, but a minute and a half I think is about what we're doing. Yeah, we we definitely need to address the conflict of interest that has going on within the BOE. Um, as you stated, you know, with the fact of the, the cozy and that was going on with um, you know, in regards to the special interests and in the new machines. I remember when that article came out and a lot, you know, even now, a lot of fact, today, one of our uh, voters in the district, you know, stated that, you know, he tried to vote and he found out that he was purged off the list. You know, you know, he couldn't vote at all. You know, and, and this is a this is a serious problem. We hear about it in Georgia. We hear about it in other states. You know, but the fact that it happens in New York, New York's supposed to be, you know, quote unquote, the most progressive is an issue. You know, we also need we also need to look at a lot of the appointments that are made to the Board of Elections. You know, a lot of it is special favors, special interests. You know, um, a lot of it is, you know, just basically pals, you know, being able to put in a position as recently happened in the Brooklyn Board of Elections, just to extend power. You know, we need to cut away from that. We need to make sure that if we're really going to do this, this is going to be, you know, we're going to make sure the board, the board of elections needs to be non, you know, need to have to be a nonpartisan type of body, you know, not just fully functional Democrats or Republicans. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to hand them a ballot and I'm hearing from them like, you should be, you know, you should be a Republican or you should be a conservative or, you know, you, no, like that needs to stop. <laughs> that needs to stop. We got, we have to protect our voters at all costs. At all Thank costs. you so much. Great. Cyril, what are your thoughts about trying to reform the Board of Elections and trying to prevent bad technology from coming into our city and state? Well, uh, <laughs> this Board of Election issue is a very technical issue that we got to address. And very, we got to be very strategic with it. We have to start from the top of Board of Elections to reform it and bring people as committed to seeing that everyone have that right to vote in the proper manner. The trainings that the Board of Elections are given, they're too short. They're trying to cram too many things into people's head in one day. Because I'm a coordinator. I started with Board of Elections as an inspector. I worked my way up all the way. I think that the trainings that they're given it's coming too much into your head. So like, for instance, you, you have some machines come in your pole inside, you're not working. There's no technician to come and tell you what to do. And they're blaming people. You have to start from top and reform it and hold the foot to the ground or fire them, get people new that's willing to do the job that they're paid to do. Great, that was very helpful. So thanks all of you for those ideas about how we would address what is clearly um, a, a very tricky issue. So um, I'm just taking a look and I think that we actually got through all of our questions. You guys were really great in terms awesome. of your time management. I really appreciate that. Uh, um, someone who made a comment did ask for more comprehensive answers on ranked choice voting from all of the candidates and did not feel that sufficient time was given 
for the answering of that issue. That was Andrea Hopkins. Andrea, do you want to go ahead and just ask your question? Is she still yes, on? Yes, hi. Hello, good evening. Hi. Um, yes. So my question is, okay, uh, um, all of the information that I'm hearing, they say, well, if your first choice is eliminated, then that vote goes to your second choice. Am I right or wrong? Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yes. So my question is, okay, let's say your third choice was eliminated. What happens to that vote for the third choice? Where does that vote go? Because no one ever mentions choice. that. They just mentioned the first choice. Right, that's because, and I, my understanding is that as long as you're, for, you only have one vote still, just okay. you have one vote and you're just gonna follow that vote through the process. So as long as your first choice is still in the race, your first choice vote counts. It doesn't matter what happens to your third, fourth, fifth choice vote. If your first choice is still in the race, that's your vote. And then the only way that vote is going to change is if there's not enough votes for your first choice to win, then right. they're gonna they're gonna rank. They basically are ranking everybody in order of the number of votes they have, and so the bottom number of votes always gets eliminated. So when right. your first choice becomes the bottom choice, it's like the one with the least amount of other votes. That's when that, that is, vote. Is, yes, but vote. what if it's not your first choice that was is at the bottom? What if it's your third choice or your then second or your then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. As long as your first choice is in, that's your vote. Does that make sense? And that, that, that doesn't make, make sense with the ranking then. It's like, why are we ranking them if, you, if it's just your first choice that matters? Well, right. it just depends on how many other people vote for your first choice. If your first choice is a popular candidate and many other people are also voting for that first choice, then they're going to stay in the race. But if your first choice is somebody that almost no one else voted for, that's when your vote is gonna start transferring to your second choice. So it does matter if you pick other choices. You don't have to, you could, if you want, just vote for one candidate like you always do. You're welcome to do that. You can do yeah. it however you want. <laughs> you can also bullet vote if you want, which is another you know popular uh, option within uh, ranked choice voting is where you pick you know your one can't favorite candidate and place them on all five uh, on all five slots, right? So I think this speaks. If I may, I don't speaks, know if, I that, speaks, if that's allowed. Though. No, that allowed? that's not allowed. That's not allowed. No, I don't think so. They no, recommend no, it. It, it will they cancel the ballot. That's uh, not the allowed. It's a void ballot. That's no good. Yeah, Lou. I don't know if you'll. What it would be? Um, I don't know if it'll it'll disqualify your ballot. But the video from the New York City Campaign Finance Board specifically said not to do that. I oh, interesting. I didn't know. I didn't. I didn't, know. I didn't, no, I didn't hear that. that. But, no. Well, I think I think this speaks, if I may, this speaks to a larger issue, which I think there's just a, a lot of confusion about ranked choice voting and the amount of uh, people that you have to choose from this election cycle. You know, you have to choose for borough president, council members, mayors. Uh, and if you don't if you're not familiar with all of the candidates that are that are on these ballots, you know, it's a very confusing process which leads me to the idea that, you know, we really needed more time and more investment in community training and outreach in order to make this an effective process. Uh, and one last thing, you know, you only give yourself uh, a choice if you are supporting the candidates that you want to choose from. One of the th biggest critiques I have about ranked choice voting in this race is that, you know, there are only really, you know, two or three candidates, you know, to choose from. Um, I, I, I take myself out of that equation for, for reasons that hopefully Lulu will explain later. But, you know, uh, but you, what, you have to, what you have to understand is that if, if, your, if your candidates, if, if the candidates that, you know, you want to rank do not appear on the ballot, if they don't make the cut, then you really have no one to choose from except the one candidate that makes the primary, right? So let me just, I think, <laughs> address what Lou's talking about, which is that he is not actually going to be on the primary ballot. So Lou oh, has nice. chosen to run for election in November, and he's going to be on the November ballot as an independent candidate. And the name of your party again, Lou? Fight for Flatbush. Fight for Flatbush. Okay. So on this particular ballot in this primary for the city council, for the 45th city Will council be three district, people. Right, there's gonna be three people. The mm -hmm. Two of the people you saw this evening, Anthony Beckford, Cyril Joseph, and also our current 
city council member, Farrah Lewis. So Third. you'll be able to, you can either just vote for one of them if you want, or you could vote for one in a second choice, or you could rank all three, one, two, three, however you choose to vote. And, I, I, and then in November, you will have a choice between whoever wins that race and the other um, people on the ballot. On the ballot. On the ballot, I think there'll probably be a Republican on the ballot also. Generally, I, I don't know if, if, they, if, they, if, they, if they're running somebody for November. So mm. it's gonna be a process. There's gonna be a primary with three candidates and then there's gonna be a general that'll have um, whoever wins that and Lou and probably another ca uh, candidate or two. It is a little confusing. And I think one of the reasons why they didn't put the information out earlier is because they had elections, um, even local elections, like in Queens, the Queens Special District race, as late as I think January or February. Um, and they didn't want to confuse people. Those races were not going to be with ranked choice voting. And so they waited until after those races were complete to roll out the information about ranked choice voting. It is probably going to confuse people, but that's how new things are. They confuse people at first and then we get used to them. The city did vote, as the video said, 74% in favor of moving to ranked choice voting. So educate your friends, educate your family, let them know that that video is available on the New York City Campaign Finance Board. And I think I put it in the chat, um, the link, and, and I'll put it in there again. So we're just gonna wrap up now. We just have four more minutes. And I wanna give each of the candidates an opportunity, just one minute to just say, Really, I want to talk about personal characteristics. It isn't something that we've really talked about very much. But if you have like one personality trait that you think is the reason why people really should choose you in this race to be our city council representative, what would that trait be, your character trait? And Cyril, why don't you go first? My character trait is plain and simple. I'm a caring person. I believe in excellency from the bottom to the top. If you come to me, as, if you elect me as a city council member, I am not going to leave you halfway. I'm going to take the problems from the starting to the top of the, to the pyramid. I want everyone that look in my face or look in my eyes and say they're satisfied with what Mr. Joe did because that's what my father instilled in me. Honestly, is the best policy. All right, thank That's you very much. Say. Honesty? Is the best policy. Honesty is the best policy, Cyril yes. Joseph. Yes. Okay, yes. Anthony, would you go next, please? It's definitely, um, I have to look at my integrity. You know, no matter what, from, from when it comes to my service to the community, longstanding service to the community, or just being, you know, being a single father, you know, or just being a friend or a fellow community member. You know, my integrity, I was, you know, I learned you know, about integrity and it's been instilled with me from my mother, you know, who raised me and also raised my sister. And then the Marine Corps has reinforced that. Coming into my community, I've actually been, you know, that's one of the main things I teach to a lot of our youth and also our fellow community members that I take you a long way because that makes you very dedicated. It keeps you consistent. It also makes you unbought and unbossed. You know, integrity plays a, a very big role in a lot that you do, especially as a council member. You know, when it comes to budgets, when it comes to legislation, when it comes to just the words that speak out of your mouth, whether it's going to be lip service or anything else from false accusations or so forth like that. So integrity is a big thing. Okay, integrity from Anthony Beckford. Thank you so much. And Lou Cespedes? So what everyone needs to know is that, you know, I am a problem solver. I pride myself on the ability to solve problems. As I said, I'm an engineer and I'm only in this race because I know that there's a problem that I can solve. And so, you know, everything that I do, I do with excellence and I do as a perfect sacrifice to God. You know, I believe that uh, there is a equal amount of investment in doing something good or doing something, uh, uh, doing something badly, doing something well or doing something badly. And so, you know, I choose to do it well. And I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a person that believes uh, in the quality of my work. And I stand by my work and, you know, I'm very proud uh, to, to, to be able to have the skill and the talent to solve problems. And that's what I bring to this community. Thank you so much. So problem solver, Lou Cespedes. Uh, <laughs> that was really uh, great to hear each of you give those answers. And I, I feel like I've learned a lot and we had a really great dialogue about um, how we can move forward to make our community a more 
wonderful place for us to live and you know improve the quality of life here and come together and and really i think create the type of, of world that we all want to yes, live in yes, so definitely, definitely. i really appreciate everyone who participated the candidates the people who uh, watched and asked questions um, this has been uh, the candidate meetup of the 45th city council district um, I think um, I think we yeah. all want to thank Tilder Anthony. I'm sure wants to thank Tilder yes, Cyril. Tilder, want to Lulu, thank you, Lulu, Joseph. and I want to thank my fellow <laughs> candidates for you know for keeping this you know uh, for keeping this lively and 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 real. You know, you yeah. guys have done. You all, my fellow candidates, and Tilder and you, Lulu, have done an extraordinary job, and we're indebted to you. Thank you so much. That's right. Yeah. Definitely, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Definitely. Thank you from, so much. As a matter of fact, so, from the last election to this election. <laughs> <laughs> Tilder Block Association is a wonderful organization, and it's been here for years. It was started by Mrs. Hyacinth Johnson, who yes. is an elder who lives on the block, an inspiration to me and many others. Um, it's a wonderful organization that prides itself in. Um, coming together and helping each other, helping the community and especially gardening and beautifying the neighborhood with flowers and trees. Uh, so I hope that you all will participate in the Tilder Block Association. And uh, this video will be available on YouTube and also hopefully on our Tilder um, Block Association Facebook page. Um, as I said, we will be interviewing the current council member, Farrah Lewis, on Tuesday, and we will also have that video available. We will be asking her the same questions, and we hope that you will share this video with your followers, your friends, anybody who has questions about the race, and most importantly, we hope that everybody will participate and will vote in the election. Election day is June 22nd, uh, yes. next month. Okay. I, 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 I won't take this opportunity to thank the Block Association for giving us the opportunity to express our views to the public to let them know where we stand. And I would ho I'm hoping that Tilda Block Association would encourage uh, the Honorable Farrow Lewis on Tuesday to invite the two of us, the two Democratic candidates as running to participate in that questionnaire. And don't forget, hold me accountable for that swimming pool. <laughs> Okay. Um, thank, thank you very much for those final words. You're more than welcome. <laughs> okay. And um, remember to vote and thank you again for attending our candidate forum. Good night. Good night. Okay. Have a good night. Right, everybody. Good Love night, everyone, 45. and have a blessed night. <laughs>